Hi, it's Carly McAvoy. I wanted to share a few stories about probability and statistics, things that I find to be interesting. And I hope that you find it to be interesting as well. The first story I want to talk about is the use of German tanks in uh, World War II, or the production of German tanks. The Panzer tanks manufactured by the Germans during World War II had parts that were numbered sequentially. So maybe um, they a part would have five, that means it was the fifth one produced. Or 75 means it was the 75th one produced. And the Allied troops captured some of these tanks and they were able to see the serial numbers on the various parts. Some parts worked better than others. And using the numbers from the parts, mathematicians were able to estimate the total number of tanks that were being manufactured from month to month. So the German tank problem is a pretty famous problem, and it's a way to estimate the total population size from a small sample. And the formula is pretty simple. The N, capital N hat is just the total number uh, that they're uh, predicting that the Germans made in this case. Um, M, the small, lowercase m, is the small, the sample maximum, which is the highest serial number that, that was in the sample, and N is the sample size. So if you captured five tanks with serial numbers 12, 23, 40, 78, and 120, the important thing is the number of the tanks and the highest serial number that you had. And so that highest serial number here was 120, 120 divided by 5, and then add that to 120 and subtract 1, and you get 143, which means the estimate for this would be that the, high, the number of tanks produced at that time were 143. What's really cool is that while the mathematicians were back making their estimates, um, the intelligence committee or spy type of people were sent out and they were supposed to be using whatever methods they had to be predicting the number of tanks produced as well. And so the next slide here, I'll show you what, this, what the estimations were. So this is the actual, and because we, later the German records were obtained and they could see the actual. So for June of 1940, sort of early on when they hadn't captured a lot of tanks, still the statistical estimate, which is the mathematician team, that's 169. And the intelligence committee out in the field were saying that they were producing 1,000 per month. And the actual German records show 122. So who is so much closer? And you can see those numbers stay close throughout, 244 compared to the Intelligence Committee of 1,550, and then the German record showing 271. And as time went on and more things were captured and their techniques got better, we get down to 327 estimate compared to 342 actually produced. That is pretty cool. All right, the next thing is lava lamps, which are cooler than you thought they were. Um, I took this picture of lava lamps from an actual YouTube video that's four minutes long, you can see. And I took that so you could see the name of that if you want to go watch this if you're into computers and internet security type of stuff. But a company called Cloudfare uses lava lamps to create truly random numbers to help protect websites and web services. Now, most random generators, which we're going to use a random generator from a computer this, this quarter. And those do fine for what we need it for, but we're not trying to protect, you know, millions of sites on the web. So, um, but most of those random generators are are an algorithm that somebody wrote to produce randomness. Well, if you write it to produce randomness, that means there is a way of predicting that randomness. So it doesn't make it truly random. At Cloudfare, they videotape the lava lamps and take a picture at a precise moment, and then they can use that picture to create a system of unpredictable bytes that they then use in their internet security. Now, they also can use um, triple pendulums to generate data points, and this is what a triple pendulum looks like. There's three different pendulums here. Notice the first one, all it can do is swing in an arc, so it's going to have a circle that's just surrounding it, that red one. But the second one at this bin, now that, that one has, this is actually the first one, this one right here is the first one, sorry, because it's going to this red circle, and that's all it can do. And the second one here is connected on, and it's shown by the green dots. It can swing around, and you can see its path, right? And the third one is the, this one here. And the third one can use the blue dots, and you can see how crazy and unpredictable its path is. It's truly unpredictable. But you could take a picture of that and then say, look at the points on a circle that 
from the outermost circle that it created or point somewhere in there and you can use that to make encryption too and this is just a picture of an encrypted I don't know what this is code or something and you can uh, you can also if you want go to uh, tap dancing goats and see a, a simulator for a double pendulum if you want to create a kind of cool picture there I think that website's kind of fun all right and finally beer and the evolution of the human species um, since the mid 20th century, scholars have been considering the possibility that some early humans grew and stored grain for beer, perhaps centuries before they had adapted the grains for use for food. And so it's so important that the original uh, legal code um, was even prescribed beer as a central unit of payment and penance. And beer also played an important role in the evolution of statistics which is what my point is, but William Seeley Gossett, a.k.a. student, uh, worked for Guinness Beer as the head experimental brewer from 1907 to 1935. And he was the first to explore the idea of statistical significance, which everybody talks about usually in their first chapter of statistics. Student produced small experimental batches of brew in an attempt to increase quality control and profits for the brewery that was producing 100 million gallons of stout annually. So think about that. He um, was he, he was doing this specifically to improve the beer at the Guinness Company. This is probably why he didn't use his own name. I have read that he used student because he didn't want people to know what he was doing and maybe duplicate it. You know, so it's competition, industry competition. Um, student work, students work invented or inspired half of modern statistics, including the t-tables, which are used for small sample sizes. Student did not have any formal training in statistics. He was self-taught, but he still managed to solve a problem that had previously eluded renowned mathematicians. So that's what I think is so cool about what, what uh, Gossett did. Um, he had a problem, and he was told by this statistical community, yeah, you can't do that. And so he said, yeah, I can. And he went out and he found a way and found a way to make really sound statistically based decisions even though he would have very small sets of observations maybe n is two or five or seven or something so he had really small sample sizes and he still was able to create a statistically sound study and created that for himself so that he could improve the beer that he was brewing that is cool all right thanks and have a fantastic day